I am pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. John Barclay. He received his PhD right here at Berkeley in uh, physical chemistry, and he went on to do a wide variety of um, things in uh, alternative energy. So currently, he is a managing member and a CTO of Emerald Energy Northwest, and um, he has 125 publications and 15 patents to his name, and he's won numerous awards. Um, he uh, was also previously the CTO of Prometheus Energy Group, which is currently up for a, a major award. And he was the founder of uh, Cryofuel Systems all in the uh, Seattle area. Uh, he previously was a professor at the University of Victoria, British Columbia, and he led the, he led the um, Advanced Technology Group at Astronautics Corporation of America. And uh, Dr. Barclay may not realize it, but he actually was a household name uh, at uh, my house growing up for a number of years. Um, my father worked for him back when my father was about my age. Um, at astronautics. And so when uh, we were coming up with speakers to invite, I immediately thought of Dr. Barclay for that reason. And also when um, I chose Berkeley, my father immediately told me, oh, well, Dr. Barclay, he went there. Um, <laughs> so, um, OK. Uh, so um, with that, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Barclay. And uh, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Amber. Uh, her father uh, was one of my most creative design engineers. So, uh, and uh, I'm going to try an experiment here. This is uh, is an opportunity to sort of transmit some experiences that I've had over a very enjoyable career, um, and it's uh, is a wonderful statistical thing, that, a problem that you do. The drunken sailor walk, okay, that, that problem. And it's, my career seems to be a little bit like that. It seems to go lots of different places. But those all were related to something that I was interested in doing, which was related to advanced energy systems and research associated with that. So I'm going to go through uh, this, this talk. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions depending on how you, you do it, but I think it's probably better to just walk through this and then ask questions at the end, but that's totally however your format is. I'm totally comfortable with either one of those. Okay, uh, so let's uh, let's start, uh, and I will uh, uh, first of all say thank you so much. It's a great honor to be back. Uh, I did actually leave here uh, in 1969 with the PhD in hand, and two weeks later I was in Australia, and and I was on a fellowship there. And that's the beginning of a path. But they, to, to come here in 1964, when Mario Savio was down on Frau Hall's steps, speaking about free speech, and having come from University of Notre Dame, which is probably one of the more conservative universities in the country, to Berkeley, which is one of the more liberal universities in the country, it was a very interesting experience. And part of the reason that I believe I am a reasonably objective, open-minded scientist is because it's forced upon you, okay, when you come to the University of California, Berkeley. And so, anyway, let me start. Uh, I've got a series of lessons that I'd like to share with you. The first one is that there are about five billion people in the, in the globe that would like to live like about 500 million of us do. And that is a huge thing that's happening. And you may have hear the acronym BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Those are major players in this process. And they are going to uh, really change how our whole world is in the next 20, 30 years. The key issues are food, water, energy. And energy is really key in this. Uh, the energy per capita is strongly coupled to the economy. The plots of energy per capita function of GDP. Uh, its price of energy is a major variable in, in how the economy evolves. And you only have to look at the, the price of fuel at the pump 
$4.25 for gasoline or more for diesel, to know that it impacts you directly. So it's important, and it's important over uh, the globe. Energy is also strongly coupled to the environment. It's critical that if we just go ahead and do business as usual, for example, to say we're going to provide all the energy that these, these countries that, that are changing, going from third world to first world countries, we will choke on CO2 because it's going to be coming from high carbon fuels. So climate, and Sandy is a good example, uh, one of the largest storms that occurred uh, today. Well, greenhouse gases, air quality, California is way up the curve on these two. Uh, I'll show you a project later on that we did in the South Coast Air Quality Management District in Southern California, and it's one of the toughest places in the world to get a permit uh, to do something related to the environment. So these are all related, and they're really, really important. Uh, finally, it's what I want to leave you with is it's important to understand and improve energy systems. If you don't take anything else away from that, Make sure you understand that because it's going to be a really critical thing. Lesson two, understand the heat trap. I'm going back to the beginning, okay? That's after I left here, I took an Australian Institute of Nuclear Science and Engineering postdoc at Monash University in Melbourne, Georgia. About 15,000 students. It was a, 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 a relatively modern university, but very good. Uh, one of the top, say, 10 or so universities in Australia. And eventually, I finished that two-year postdoc and got offered a, a position as a chemistry graduate in the physics department. So that was always a little bit interesting. Uh, and I, one of the things that three of us did in the young uh, lectures was to develop a new course called Physical Science for Non-Scientists. So we were trying to say, how do we reach out to the other people at the University of at Monash and introduce them to energy systems? And that's actually quite an interesting question to answer and address. And what we tried to figure out, what topics would we teach? How do you teach somebody that had maybe general science at freshman year in high school and no science beyond that? How do you teach them what the concept of temperature is? How do you teach them what energy is? How do you teach them what, what uh, all kinds of other things are when you're trying to describe energy systems? And of course, one of the things that we were looking at is how the different forms of energy was one of the topics. So we talked about chemical potential, nuclear gravitational. And we did the calculations, for example, of how much nuclear waste would be involved for producing all the global energy using nuclear. And got staggering numbers. And so that sort of opened some of their eyes. We did chemical potential and looked at that. And a lot of good examples of gravitation. So and the students sort of got this idea. The thing that got me was interesting that we can do energy conversions. First of all, they always thought energy is used. So teaching concept of conservation of energy was something new. And that was interesting. We did that. And you convert from one form to another. And most of these are semi-reversible. But most of them also have some aspect of that conversion that turns up to be thermal energy. And so you go to all these different uh, list and you can go to just about anything you can think of, converting one form of energy to another form of energy, and you end up with thermal. And once you get to thermal energy, the key point that I learned way back then is you can't get it all back. Okay, so you're you're locked into this heat trap, and that to me said to me, my golly, I better really start to study thermal math. And I begin to do that and seriously trying to understand how you manipulate thermal energy to the maximum possible efficiency. And so the heat trap is a very important thing to understand, in my opinion, and the applied thermodynamics is, of course, incredibly important to, to chemical engineering, uh, and so it's important to do that. Third lesson, choose relevant topics for projects. And this, I, after eight years uh, in Australia, I was on a, a speaking tour, went around uh, the world, Australia is a long ways away, and I wanted to continue to interact with my colleagues, and I was on a speaking tour, and, uh, and ended up giving a talk at Los Almos National Lab. And it wasn't too long after that that they, they said, my God, we've got a perfect job for you. Uh, would you like to apply for this? And I said, wow. Uh, and I said, yes. It was in the energy division, so it's outside 
defense, as they say, so I wasn't working on um, weapons. Uh, I was working on energy system. And they wanted to work on, on this particular uh, uh, condensed matter and thermal physics group. They were, were working on cryogenic engineering low temperature physics. And that just fit perfectly with what I was working on at Los Alamos. By the way, my PhD was done up at the Rat Lab uh, with David Shirley. And we were doing work at uh, about between 5 and 10 millikelvin, looking at, at a whole bunch of interesting neat things that happen when you cool samples down to those low temperatures. So, and that, he had done his PhD with uh, Joe. And when I came to these seminars over in the chemistry department, occasionally Professor Joke would come in and sit down about right there where that, that blue sweater is, white hair, retired already, and he would, at the end of the seminar, ask three or four incredibly penetrating questions. So uh, you can try that on me. <laughs> you may not get the same kind of answers as he expected to get. I'll leave that to Dr. Preston. <laughs> uh, so, OK, there you go. Uh, so basically, Los Alamos is research heaven. Uh, it's, it's a place you go when you want to learn an immense number of new things. And it, I learned all kinds of thermal physics. I learned how to do very uh, elegant computational fluid dynamics. I learned how to do materials work out all kinds of things. And anything you don't know, about three phone calls, and you find somebody that knows the answer. And that's why I call it Research Heaven. And you had a lot of money, so that was very nice. Uh, and I was recruited for applied superconductivity projects, and so I begin to explore efficient magnetic refrigeration. And this was something where obviously I knew about magnetic refrigeration because I had gone down to 5 or 10 millikelvin using magnetic refrigeration, but it was from 1 kelvin down to 5 millikelvin, not upwards. And that's the classic magnetic uh, demagnetization, adiabatic demagnetization that you do. Well, a, a, a colleague, uh, Jerry Brown at NASA Lewis in Cleveland, had done something really quite remarkable. He had taken gadolinium metal, uh, it's a ferromagnet, at room temperature, it has a curry temperature of just about 300 Kelvin, and he had put it into thin sheets, uh, put it into a magnetic field, and its temperature increased to 7 tesla magnetic field. Temperature went up by about 15 degrees. And then he put it through, he moved it, uh, actually a column of alcohol, uh, and cooled the magnetic material down by this column of alcohol, which had a temperature gradient in it, and then demagnetized it. It cooled, cooled the bottom of the column of alcohol, and he moved this column of alcohol back and forth when he magnetized it, demagnetized the thing. And amazingly enough, with the 15 degree temperature change, he got a span in this alcohol column of about 80 degrees Kelvin at room temperature, and it blew me away. I couldn't imagine that you could do that with magnetic refrigeration. So we began to look at that seriously uh, and started at 1 Kelvin and going upwards in temperature, uh, up towards 300 Kelvin was what we were doing at Los Alamos. Very interesting problem, and, and this was very interesting because when we did the calculation, it looked like magnetic refrigeration had the possibility of being very efficient, which was, this was what I was trying to accomplish. Anyway, we were working on a project from DOE, it's a 1 gigawatt superconducting power transmission line. Interesting enough, they call it SPTA spill. Interesting uh, name for things. But it, had, it required many kilowatts of cooling to 5 Kelvin with supercritical helium. And this is a big refrigeration project. We were asked to work on this. And one of the problems that I had to solve was how long does it take to cool down a superconducting power transmission line that's 100 kilometers long? And this is a, this is a cable about this big around, a superconductor in the middle. You've got all these 19 layers of stuff that you do to isolate it thermally. And then you put supercritical helium down the center and cool it down to 5 Kelvin. Superconducting, you can carry a huge amount of power in it. That was what the, the problem was. And, and it was very interesting. Um, it takes about two weeks, by the way, to calculate. That's how long it takes to cool it down. You can do that calculation. It's very interesting. But what I found as I was doing this problem after about a year of working on this kind of thing, I then began to look at what, mat what matters. And I said, if I take the efficiency of this helium refrigerator and magically turn it into a very efficient, 100% efficient refrigerator, what happens? And the answer was nothing. Okay. And so I found myself frustrated because I had a problem where all the work I was doing didn't have any impact on the problem. And so the real problem was 
all of the engineering goes into it, all the superconducting stuff. It, the refrigeration was very, very low impact. And so I said, my God, I want to work on something that has an impact. I began to look at where could I apply more efficient magnetic refrigeration. And about that time, uh, there were two places that came up. One was liquid hydrogen, and one was space. And so the, the liquid hydrogen one actually was very interesting when it led, it came from Kennedy Space Center. They came out and talked to us about the, the launch pad 39A and B, which are those big launch pads where the shuttles actually took off them. And we went out, visited there, and 875,000 gallon barrel of liquid hydrogen, great big huge barrel, filled with liquid hydrogen. The boil off from that tank was costing NASA about $6 million a year. The boil off would come off, they put it out to a burn pond, and you see all these little, little, little things pop up on this water, about a, about a block of water, and they would burn. And that's how they got rid of the hydrogen. They burned it off. They said, can you design a refrigerator that will reliquify that boil off hydrogen? And it make it efficient, make it cost effective and small. And so that was the first one of these things that was associated with liquid hydrogen. The other one that was interesting was Lockheed came to us. And many of you have probably heard of Lockheed Skunk Works, where they developed some of the really advanced planes in the world. Well, they had a design from a Lockheed Skunk Works F that was, wanted to, to fly a, a plane fueled on liquid hydrogen, and they wanted to stay up for 24 hours straight. And so, well, yeah, can you do something like that? I said, well, yeah, we probably can. And of course, you always say yes when somebody comes in with a question like that. And, and, uh, and, and so we did, and we began to look at it. And that then was interesting enough for them to say, now, can you build a, a liquid hydrogen plant that would satisfy all the airplanes that came into San Francisco International? And Chicago O'Hare was the other one they had to look at. And wow, that turns out to be a lot of liquid hydrogen. Uh, that fueled all the planes that were coming in. So we did that study for Lockheed, and that said, wow, this is, this is a problem where this matters. Liquid hydrogen is a very fragile hydrogen. Vaporizes quite easily. It has a very low, uh, almost as bad as helium, but it has a very low sense, uh, latent heat and a very high sensible heat. So it, you look at it, and it evaporates almost. Okay, So you have to really insulate it well, and you have to liquefy it at 20 Kelvin. And that takes a lot of energy. So efficiency mattered a lot, and there was a lot of it that was important. The other thing that we realized was that in space, there was an application as well, where they were looking at cryocoolers for, on a cooling a sensor in space application, where they're looking down up 40 miles up, and the signal to noise is a big issue. So you have to cool it down to around 4 Kelvin to reduce the signal to noise to low enough to be able to read the paper on your desk, okay, from that distance up. But they can do that kind of thing. And so they were asking us, and this came from uh, DARPA, you know DARPA, and, uh, and it also came from some of the Air Force, right side of the Air Force base, asking us, could you design an efficient small refrigerator that could go into space? And it turns out that, that we said we thought we could begin to look at that. So these are the things that I got involved in as a result of being frustrated by this project here. I finished that project up and, and moved on to other things. So lesson three, choose projects you really turned on by and they make a difference. All right, that's, what, that's what I would say to you. This is a really interesting one. This is either called the Strobridge Curve. How many people have seen these before? But Dick Strobridge was from, at the time, at National Bureau of Standards at Boulder, NIST now at Boulder. And what he did was to collect a whole bunch of, of data from existing or under development refrigerators and liquefiers. Because what I wanted to understand was why the liquefiers for hydrogen were as inefficient as they looked like they were. And so I've got this curve, and a couple things that jump out at you. Look at this curve. This is percent of Carnot. So it's normalized to Carnot efficiency. It clearly takes you know, 74 watts per watt to cool something from helium temperature, 4 degrees Kelvin, to 300 Kelvin, okay? Carnot factor is T hot over T cold minus 1. Okay. That's the, that factor is 74 for helium. It's 14 for hydrogen. So it means that for every watt of cooling power that you put in at low temperatures, you have to put in 74 or 14. And 
And if that's what this means relative to Carnot. So he normalized it that way. But what he put on this plot, there's a lot of data points here. And you notice that about 30, this is 10%, 20%, 30%. The highest efficiency that any of these devices had was about 32, 35%. And this is at a megawatt of cooling power. So this is a cooling power. Your little cryo coolers are in this set of range over here. They're a few percent. So if you want to make a helium refrigerator work down here at one watt, you're probably going to pay about seven and a half kilowatts for every watt of refrigeration. And if those of you that use a Giff McMahon crowd cooler in any of your experiments, you'll see that that's about the size of the compressor that you have. So that's real. Now, what's interesting, first of all, it goes to 35. And the second thing that was really more interesting to me was that this is temperature dependent. So you sort of intuitively, I say, well, it's got to be much more difficult to make a helium liquefier or a hydrogen liquefier than a liquid nitrogen liquefier. Not true. Okay. And so you say, what's it, what does that mean? Okay. And you think about it, ask the question. Again, understand the implications of the data. The lesson that I took from this, it meant what? It meant that the, the inefficiency was already gone before you ever got to the cold temperature. You already had blown it. And sure enough, when you then begin to think about what could that be, it's a compressor. Okay? So Here's good old thermodynamics, control volume around, beautiful thing about thermodynamics, you can draw the control volume where you want to. So you take it around the compressor, work in, mass flow through it, heat out potentially, low pressure in, high pressure out, and you apply first law of thermodynamics, basically the open law for open systems, right here to this system, and you end up with an isotropic compressor uh, that Q is zero, entropy doesn't change, it's constant, and hence you end up with this relatively straightforward expression for the work per unit mass, work rate per unit mass flow of the difference in enthalpies at high and low pressure. If you do it isothermally, you get a more complicated expression because you now have heat transfer out of the system and you get something that involves the entropy changes and the enthalpy changes. Really important equation in liquefaction. So analyzing this, it shows, it's better to look over here, if you do an iso, you take, here's your, this is the temperature entry diagram, and you all know these uh, very well, I'm sure. Uh, low pressures and high pressures, in fact, these are reversed. This should be low pressure, this should be high pressure. And you start from this pressure here, you go up isotropically, and lo and behold, the temperature jumps up. That's, that's, say, hey, that's no problem. I'll just put a good after cooler after the compression, I'll get all that energy back. If you do, a polytropic compression and then the isothermal compression. This is a minimum work you can put in for a compressor, and that's the ideal compressor. Perfect compressor is an isotropic, I mean, isothermal compression process. So you take that and you say, "My gosh, clearly this is this is huge." Now the killer is that as soon as you take that up to high temperatures, it's inefficient. You can never capture all that energy efficiency. You create entropy because you're transferring heat across the delta T. And I'll show you that in just a minute. So sure enough, and this temperature, by the way, is not particularly small. It depends on the gas you're compressing, gamma of the gas, but also the pressure ratio. But this could be two or 300 Kelvin. So it's, it's a significant temperature change. So that's where we, we found that. We then did, and I'll show you one more cooperative thing. This is, a, this is what we actually do you know, process flow diagrams for these kinds of things, but here is a hydrogen liquefier. Don't worry about this, the liquid nitrogen loop. But if you take and look at this process flow, it's pre cooled in this heat exchanger, further in liquid nitrogen goes down through this heat exchanger. It, it's split here, part of it goes through the expander to provide cooling. This is an isentropic expander, which is a perfect one. Goes back here, comes back through, provides cooling for the, the other part of the process stream, which goes on down and eventually goes through a JT valve. So the characteristic of a quad cycle liquefier is a combination of an isentropic expander and an isenthalpic expander, which is a JT valve. And you get some yield with liquid hydrogen, the gas comes back and goes through this whole system. Now, so you can take and draw these up and analyze these. You can use HISIS or a number of other good codes to analyze these in great detail. Uh, what you'll find is if you, if you go back and look at the literature, uh, there was a, a very good scientist, Charlie Baker, at Pratt Serres, a very re reliable uh, cryogenic engineer. 
he looked at the quantitative thermodynamic analysis of the pre pollute cod cycle, right? And here it is, 225 metric tons per day. That's about you know, just less than a million gallons per day. So it's a pretty big liquefier. So all the efficiencies are going to be in that system. And he went and calculated this in Journal of Hydrogen Energy. You can look it up. Uh, ideal work of liquefaction is, is, is this number here in kilowatt hours per kilogram, or this in kilojoules per kilogram. And the real work of liquefaction is, and I'll show you well how that relates in a minute, but it's several times higher, three times higher. The figure of merit is how measure of the performance of a liquefier is 0.36. And that's about as good as you can get. And so the detailed analysis identified here, the work increases and the efficiency reduced. Look at all the different things that he did. And lo and behold, sure enough, all three of those compressors produce over 60% of your work. And so you, 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 you had the culprit of what we needed. So the next thing that, that we did, uh, we learned, uh, that we, I remember specifically learning from, was to take, and normally you take the second law of thermodynamics and you say it's an inequality. The, the total entropy of, of a process is greater than or equal to something. And Tolman and Fine, and Tolman is the statistical mechanics author, uh, some of you have used his book, in Reviews of Modern Physics about 1948, they decided to write this uh, the second law of thermodynamics as an equality here. So the work total is Take the second part of this, the cooling power times the Carnot factor plus the integral over the irreversible entropy produced in a cycle normalized over that same temperature range. And this was, I thought it was a stunning thing because now it meant that if I had this equations for the irreversible entropy production, I could get a detailed understanding of the efficiency of all these different cycles. And that's precisely what I proceeded to start to do for magnetic cycles in addition to gas cycles. And the figure of merit, as I mentioned before, is a ratio of the ideal minimum work, that's the best you can do for a particular gas, divided by the real work. Okay? So here's another lesson. It's really important to get this uh, and understand the second law of thermodynamics for uh, analyzing systems and understanding reversible entropy. Here's an example to show you how important that is. This is, let's assume that I have uh, a refrigerator that has got a heat exchanger that cools the heat exchanger to say 20 Kelvin and I'm putting purified gaseous hydrogen at 300 Kelvin, a tenth of a megapascal, through that heat exchanger and make it liquid. Right? And I calculate how much work I have to put into this refrigerator to provide the cooling power. And you can calculate the, the, you know, the cooling power required is the enthalpy difference for this stream from this point to this point, well defined. I mean, you can look up for, for that hydrogen, take a certain uh, unit mass and calculate that. That gives you the cooling power of this heat exchanger. So this cooling power goes into this refrigerator. The work comes in to pump that heat up to high temperature, and you can calculate all these things very nicely. When you do this calculation with the perfect refrigerator and a perfect heat exchanger, it's 100% perfect, both of those. The figure of merit that you get for this, 25%. Where did that happen? Okay. And of course, if you think about it a little bit, it's right here. It's in the approach. So at the top end of this heat exchanger, you've got 300K gas looking at 20 degrees K. So you've got that temperature approach, it collapses very fast. That temperature approach collapses in that heat exchanger because it's a perfect heat exchanger. But you have created entropy like you wouldn't believe in that process. And so what it tells you is that even with perfect components, if you don't design the system such that temperature approaches are small, you will never get an efficient device. So there's two things we came out with. One, we have to eliminate the compressor. Right. Number two, we have to have very small temperature approaches throughout our design. And otherwise, we can't get it a really, really efficient device. So we begin to explore magnetic, and again, most of you probably see this, but I'll go quickly through this. Here is a conventional compression of gas that heats up. You can take that heat out, expand the gas after you do that, it cools, and you can add heat. So this is a this is a gas Carnot cycle, uh, pretty standard uh, type of device. This temperature change is, can be 100 degrees Kelvin or more uh, in the conventional device, depending on the gas and the compression ratio. 
The magnetic analogy, analogy is that if you take a magnet here and you take a magnetic material like gadolinium metal or you got probably 300 of these materials that you could use, you put it into a magnetic field that heats up. Gadolinium heats up by about 2 degrees per tesla, so if we have a 7 tesla magnetic field, you get about 50 degrees. So it's less than this 100 degrees or so here in this process, which is important if you want to keep the temperature small. You then take heat out, then pull it out, and it cools down. This can then add heat to it. So this is a magnetic Carnot cycle. This cycle, though, only goes about 15 degrees max, and that doesn't get you from 300 Kelvin to 20 Kelvin, which is what we wanted to accomplish. So you have to take another step. You have to say, aha, how do I get a large temperature span? And you design a refrigerator that has the following steps in it. It has an adiabatic magnetization process, which is where we put it into the field, here's the high field region, and we tend to take the heat of magnetization away, the heat exchanger, and then before we take it out of the magnetic field, we run it through a regenerator. This is a Jerry Brown thing where you put it through that alcohol column, and that's what he used to do that. He cooled it down before he demagnetized it. We then take the pick up a load, put it back through the regenerator, and we have a complete cycle. So, this regenerator, because it has a T-hot at one end and a T-cold at the other end, increases the span of the refrigerator. And if you have a really efficient regenerator here, you can increase the span arbitrarily. So, regenerators, you know what a regenerator is? It's a periodic heat exchanger. Okay? So, it's more complex than the steady state counterflow heat exchanger. So, you have to understand this device, and it's periodic, but it's time dependent. It goes back and forth. The flow goes back and forth to the regenerator. And one of the Mokshapa books that I first learned about this, uh, he said this is one of the most complex thermal devices known to man. And uh, so I, I take him at his word. I'm still trying to figure the damn out. Okay. Uh, so the, the next lesson is capture IP. Well, I don't know how many of you have thought about something that you think, my God, I've got something that's really unique and useful, novel, useful, and and uh, what else? Uh, three things you have to satisfy. Useful novel and something I'll think of it next. Anyway, intellectual property, IP. So if you have new ideas, and I'm sure the University of California Berkeley has a process for, for doing that and dealing with that, but once you get into industry or other jobs, it's going to be critically important for you. So what we did at Los Alamos is before we could publish a paper at Los Alamos, we had to submit it through the intellectual property division. We had to, they had to test you on it. So, uh, and if it was a new ID, you had to apply for a patent before you could release it to the press. So, here's a case where uh, Bill Steyer and I came up with the idea of combining the refrigerant and the regenerator to make a new cycle called the active magnetic regenerative cycle. Is the way it works. This is a, a regenerator, just a, a layer bed from, from right to left. This is up near room temperature. And then we layer different materials. There might be 10 materials in this all the way down to some cold temperature that we want to reach. So we just select different materials with different curry points, different adiabatic temperature changes, and you put that together in a device like this, and then you magnetize it. If you do that, the whole thing goes up in temperature by some delta T, which is proportional to temperature, and then you flow gas from the left side to the right side, taking that heat of magnetization away for the whole thing. Now demagnetize it once you blow to a certain extent, it cools down, and now you take this gas that you put through a heat exchanger and you put it back through, go the other way, you get cold gas, you can pick up a load. And here's the cycle. So this is a TS diagram for magnetic material. We increase the magnetic uh, field, and it's adiabatic in this case, you see, goes up to by some delta T. We then run the fluid through it to cool it. We then demagnetize, we come back up by reversing the flow of the gas. So this little cycle here is a magnetic braking cycle. And when you couple a whole bunch of magnetic braking cycles together like this with the heat transfer fluid, you get the active magnetic. But it was new. We, had, we got a patent on it. By the way, it just expired not too long ago. But that was a, 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 it got a lot of publicity because people began to look at a cycle like this that could do this. Now, next lesson. Entropy change, and I've heard entropy used several times today, which is good. Uh, and flow and magnetic refrigerants are important. So, so you not only had to understand that. So, one of the, the people here today said they don't teach magnetic thermodynamics 
to any of you any longer. Well, if you do that, if you take and say, what is the total entropy change for a case where the two principal variables are, are temperature and magnetic field, what you will find is that you need to know the adiabatic temperature change, which is on this plot, delta T versus T, and you need to know the field-dependent heat capacity. So here is the heat capacity that you're using, you're used to looking at, is the, you know, the standard, uh, the standard by equation, plus a little bit of electronic, if it's metallic, uh, equation is a function of temperature. If you put a magnetic phase in there, in this case it happens to be gadolinium nickel, you end up at the current temperature getting this very large change in the heat capacity. And at different fields it changes uh, in the following measured way. And so this happens to be uh, data that we had to measure. When I was at Los Alamos, we didn't have any of this data really at all. But we measured all kinds of compounds. And this is still going on. There are now, I think, something like 300 publications in magnetic refrigeration and magnetic materials. And there are probably 100 patents in this area uh, from all different places around the world of things. These are both very important. You need to have both these pieces of information to do a complete uh, simulation of the magnetic system. So, okay, now, that's one of the things that got me started. Um, I was at Los Alamos, and, and I, I, I do take this lesson seriously. I, I think you should all be business people, but I know that's probably not the right thing for all of you to do. Uh, so, uh, I think you should also all be great scientists, and that is not the right thing for all of you to do. Uh, and so, you have to make those choices yourself. Uh, I know that when I came here from Notre Dame, I was pretty high up in the class at Notre Dame, uh, and I, this is a great humbling place, okay? Uh, I think that there were you know, 30 or 40 of us in the thermodynamics class, and, and uh, I realized I wasn't at the bottom of the class, but I was a long way from the top of the class, okay? And, uh, and if one day somebody wore his, I think it was his, 5 beta kappa key in, and the next day, you know, two-thirds of the class came in with their 5 beta kappa keys on. And, and put the person into appropriate uh, uh, position. But anyway, long and short of it, this is a fantastic place. You guys are all very bright, and I respect that immensely. I think it's really important. Uh, and, uh, and so some of you want to be entrepreneurs, and I respect that. I think I would encourage that. It's a, but it's not for everybody, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about why. Uh, anyway, Stevenson Wilder Act in 1981, uh, and uh, it, it was passed. This is a technology transfer act. This is driven by the Congress saying, my golly, we're spending uh, Los Alamos budget that uh, at that time was 300 million a year or some big number like that. And they had all these neat projects that we did, like spittles and all kinds of other projects. We would work on them for a year or so and get the results, publish the paper, and take it down to the basement, put it on the shelf. And I know that doesn't happen at universities like here, uh, but it happened at Los Alamos. So, uh, what happened was they passed this act that says every math national lab had to spend a portion, a small portion, of their budget on transfer technology out of the lab, commercial. And I, and that was, and certain land, Los Alamos National Lab projects with potential commercial application were selected, and magnetic refrigeration was one of those projects. So they said, hey John, you're a PI on this project, why don't you, why don't you think about considering transfer this technology out of the lab. And so I, wow, I, well, I don't know much about that. And so one of the people, the professor from the University of New Mexico said, why don't you take my course, my graduate course, in technical entrepreneurship. What a wonderful topic, okay? And indeed, this was a great course. It taught me how to write a business plan, so to speak. And so I thought. Uh, anyway, I wrote my first business plan as a course project. And at the end of that, I realized that I was trying to create a new company. I created the first company, Thermomagnetic Devices, and the business plan was probably 100 pages thick. And a few people started to look for money, and I was trying to raise $5 million. And again, amazing amount of money, uh, but that's what I tried to do. And a company called Astronautic Corporation of America uh, had just, just set up an advanced technology center in Madison, Wisconsin. They were based in Milwaukee. And they were about a 150 million a year company, aerospace company. Most of the planes that were flying back and forth across the country had at least one of their instruments in the cockpit. So all of the different attitude indicators and horizontal threats and, and all of those kinds of instruments like that that were, were built by astronauts. So it's a good design manufacturing company. They said, we don't, 
we'd love your idea. We'd love to have magnetic refrigeration because they were interested in space. They wanted to build crowd coolers for space. That was part of their business, extended business, and they needed a group to do that. So they said, okay, we'll invest $5 million, but we won't do it in New Mexico where this company was created. So this is a company that got created and then went into oblivion. You know, never ever hired anybody. Uh, uh, just created, uh, incorporated, and then went out of uh, existence. So, but Astronautics said, you guys come from Los Alamos to Astronautics in Madison, and the lab had set up this wonderful program. For two years, you could leave, and they would welcome you back if you failed. And so, wow, that's a wonderful safety net. And so we, four of us decided to do that. I led that group. And the two of them actually did go back uh, out of the four. The other one is still at Astronautics at, at the moment. And, and uh, anyway, they did invest more than eight, uh, five million, actually about uh, eight million dollars in this. And they, I became eventually uh, the manager when I started and eventually became the director of their technology center. And we did all kinds of neat things there. But mostly we worked on advanced magnetic refrigerators. And one of our awards was from the Strategic Defense Initiative, we got the Best Cryo Cooler of the Year award. And that was pretty neat. This was, of course, thinking about, OK, how do you put interceptors and all kinds of other things for rockets and neat stuff. Uh, but there was another program that we worked on, which was the National Aerospace Fund. And I have a patent on making slush hydrogen, OK? Because slush hydrogen is liquid and solid 13.8 Kelvin, about 50 50 mixture. It has a higher energy density than liquid hydrogen, and there are two or three ways to make it, and we created a new one and actually got a patent on it. And I got that patent was allowed in before I left astronautics at about 1992, it was allowed, and it never got issued until about two years ago. And it was because it was NASA security. So the NASA security that no, you can't issue that patent. It's allowed, it's accepted as a, as a new in invention, but you can't issue it. And so I just all of a sudden, you know, a couple years ago, get this announcement, yeah, your patent has been issued. I said, what? And so I, I just uh, found that out. Anyway, fun stuff. Uh, but uh, what I was learning was a lot of good business skills. The CEO of the company was the founder of the company. Uh, he was a very, very good cash flow manager, he, and he would take me down uh, every week for about for down in Milwaukee, go through uh, essentially four hours of tutorials on how you run a business. Great learning. Uh, the thing was that they were they were government business, and so what I did is I went to the board and I said, "Hey, look, I'd like to form a commercial division for the company," and they said. No, thank you. We're going to stick to what we know, which is government business. They're very good at that. But they were, and so they turned me down, and so I decided to go form my own company. So I resigned to form a design manufacturing energy company in Seattle, and it's, I formed Crowd Fuel Systems, Inc. in 1993. And I realized, though, from that, that tutorial was that I needed something that created revenue. And and I'll show you in a minute why I focus on liquid natural gas rather than liquid hydrogen. I couldn't see anybody that would buy liquid hydrogen systems, okay, enough to sustain a company. And so I chose to focus on liquid natural gas, and I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, but at the same time as I was going out there, uh, I was approached by the University of Victoria, British Columbia, and they offered me an endowed full professorship in mechanical engineering. So, I'm probably one of those unique people in chemistry that's been tenured in physics and mechanical engineering, but never in chemistry. Okay? So that, uh, it just means that you learn how to learn and you keep doing it. Uh, anyway, this is a really interesting group. I had about 12 graduate students uh, at Maximum. We did a whole bunch of R&D related to liquid natural gas. We looked at every one of the liquefied technologies. We looked at a whole bunch of, of purification technologies. Start to really start to learn how to do chemical engineering in a big way, uh, and this this but this institute for integrated energy systems there really created a lot of new ideas. And I want to and I taught the graduate undergraduate course in, in cryogenic engineering, properties of engineering materials. Just as a fun, I really enjoy teaching, uh, and that was a lot of fun. The difficulty was with this was that um, it it was an opportunity to avoid being a dinosaur. 
when I was the director of the Technology Center in Madison, I had a, a full-time personal secretary, I had a clerical secretary, uh, and I had a clerk to file documents and stuff like that. So I had three people supporting me, and needless to say, I was incapable of running the new DOS computers that came in uh, and had to figure out how to do that. Uh, went to university, of course, you could do all your stuff yourself. And, and so that was interesting. It, it got me away from being a dinosaur, and that's really important. Here's one of the things, the lesson I gave, which is really important. Uh, this is the, this is, these are the Marchetti curves, they're called. They were done by the, the Integrated Industry uh, uh, Systems Institute in Vienna. Uh, and I'm just going to flip through these so I can talk to them here. This is Peter Marchetti. Uh, group at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And he plotted here, this is a percent of, of total energy use from 1850 up to 2150 as a function of, of the different mixes of sources and uses. So the solid lines are their projections for the different fuel forms. This was the solids, the liquids, and the gases. And the thing they did differently from way back from the Club of Rome and a bunch of other really interesting early first energy crisis kind of calculations, is they just took the froze technology now and projected what happens 20, 30 years from now. Bad idea, okay? It, you tend to get very erroneous results. You have to let technology evolve, and that was really important. They did that, and they came up with these curves. So the thing that struck me is two things. One, one the, the, the lines like this, are the actual use data, and you see that those are actually not far off of what's happening. And now, of course, with shale gas, the methane thing has jumped way up to here, and, and out here in, in 2012, and, and, and oil is continuing to go down, and so is solids. But what you see is sustainable economic growth. This is where I all of a sudden, bingo, light bulb went on. That's something that made sense to me. To say sustainable means it's repeatable and for a long period of time. Renewable means you can repeat it. It's even better. Okay? Uh, but decentralized, less capital intensive technologies, and that, so that was really good. And you can see methane and hydrogen. So these are gaseous fuels, no longer salt. So that's just liquefaction is really important. You better be able to make good, efficient liquefiers. So that reinforced what I was already working on before, and it was good. Now, the other second thing on this is that these curves are not depletion driven. Their technology substitution. And that is so key to understand. These are, we're not running out of coal. We have lots of coal. If we use coal and just burn it the way we have, we are going to choke. Okay? It's too much CO2. Okay? So there's a bunch of implications of that. So we have better technology. And a perfect example, uh, as much as it is, it is uh, uh, debatable that it's all good, horizontal drilling and fracking. That has changed the whole way the United States is looking at energy systems. The amount of natural gas we have available is just huge. It has a big impact for energy security and much more, uh, more less expensive fuel and so on. So that's the key thing that I want to just leave with you. The second thing I want to show you why I went into natural gas is, is here. I looked at U.S. energy. How many people know in the room, you write down on a piece of paper, how much energy we use per year in the U.S.? Everybody? I hope so. Okay? It's, the answer is about 100 quads. What the hell is a quad? Okay, great unit. Okay, definitely not SI. It's quadrillion BTU. Okay, 10 to the 15th BTU. That's a quad. And that's a unit that the Department of Energy and the Energy Information and, and a lot of the industry in the United States use instead of the proper SI unit. Anyway, about 100 quads of energy are used per year. And here's where we get it from coal, natural gas and renewables, nuclear, and petroleum, where it comes from. And this is a little bit dated. I have the 2010 data. I just didn't get time to put it in here. Uh, not so different. And then I looked at the petroleum. And you think, my god, we have 63% of our transportation will come from petroleum, which we know. And unfortunately, of this petroleum now, we're about 50% imported. What's higher? But it's getting better as we start to have more and more indigenous petroleum in the United States. But we were importing about 60% of the Detroit a few years ago, and it had an enormous impact on the balance payment. The deficit was huge, and that largely comes from almost a billion dollars a day, I calculated, that we pay every day 
that we send offshore, okay, that's taking money out of your, all of our pockets, sending it over. So this was a big one to me. He said, wow, that's important to look at. And then I looked over here, this little tenth of a percent that you can barely see the little line there, I should have picked a better color, is the transportation sector supplied by natural gas at 2005. Unbelievable. I said, why? We should be taking a big chunk of this and using natural gas to do that. And that's what the light bulb went on. I said, my God, that's a great business opportunity to look at. Make, be part of that transition. And that's what I proceeded to do. That's why with Cryofuel Systems, I went ahead and focused on liquid natural gas because I thought it was important. And what you did the market studies on this, which we did, there were quite a good ones out. It clearly, if Evidence was that lack of refueling infrastructure was the key barrier. Why? Natural gas is a great fuel, cleaner, safer, cheaper, and and why wasn't everybody using it? Well, the reason was that it wasn't available. So, just to show you some of the plants that we did, this is a stranded well gas, the liquid natural gas plant that was operated in Central California. The, the, the gas well is out in the middle of that great field back over there, and that comes down under a pipe under this road about a mile, comes into the plant, and comes up over here, and then goes through TSA, temperature swing absorber bed. These two beds purify the CO2 and water. Here's the screw compressor back, back there. That was a single screw compressor. Here's the gen for the power. The coal box is back here. And here's the LNG storage tank, about 15,000 gallons LNG storage tank. So this made about 5,000 gallons every day, and it ran very well. All of the this is a great applied kind uh, of So, you know, block process flow diagram, you know, PFD, PNID, you know, all of the different stuff that you do in, in chemical engineering, you learned all that basic stuff, is applied here, big time. Plus, this is all designed to code, uh, very compliant with about 20 different codes that you have to build to because you're, you're doing energy. So, uh, Anyway, this produced about 300,000 gallons of LNG, and then the well decided to go south and didn't have enough gas to, to make the liquid. Here's the other end of that plant, just to show you that, that here's that storage tank. Uh, looking at it from the other angle, there's a bunch of controls. This whole thing was automatically controlled. I actually ran this plant from my hotel room, uh, 40 miles away from this, uh, and could do that on my laptop. If I had the program, I could load it up right now and run it from here. And pretty soon, when any of the Northwest gives, this is going to be on here, okay? And I can give you this plant, I'll be able to control and run a plant like this from my iPhone, okay? And, uh, or iPad. And anyway, this is, you hook up, the, the truck comes in here, there's a scale, you can drive onto the scale, and then you connect up the, the LNG light. And then the vapor return line to the other line, you ground everything and do all the things according to safety, and you, you then turn the pump on, the driver's over here, he programs in, I want this tank to weigh just under 80,000 pounds, so see if the weight when it's full, all automatically done. And when it gets up to close to 80,000 pounds, it pump automatically shuts off, comes over, and does the reverse process, loads up, drives away, takes it to a customer. And that's the way you take about 10,000, 9,500 gallons of LNG away at a time. Okay, now today is Halloween, so this is why I put this first sentence in here. It's expect surprises. If you become an entrepreneur, I guarantee you, you are going to be surprised in almost every day. And it just goes on. So uh, you have to anticipate that, and there are just, we didn't anticipate all kinds of things. I would have had a $6 million investment by a wealthy Mexican company. We had been through three months of due diligence, of looking at everything. They liked what they saw. They gave us a deal. We said, great. And we were five days from signing the paper, and the peso evaluation occurred. The peso dropped by 40% in value, and they shut the deal down. So, boom. And boy, it hits you right about there. Uh, fifth round of financing, uh, $5 million was uh, 2001. Dot com. Boom. Now, was I smart enough to figure that out? I guess I should have been. When people are saying it's got a new economy associated with the dot com bus and blah, 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 or dot com business. But the reality is, is that I had one angel investor lost $14 million in two weeks' time. And needless to say, he wasn't interested in investing in my company. So 
Uh, that is the kind of thing that happens to you. Champions. I have East Ohio Gas, big gas company. We had a great project with them, going really gangbusters. They had built a prototype and everything with us. And then they decided to re-engineer. Company, big company, and they decided to change people around and find out where they best supply and all that stuff. Both of the, my internal champions in that company got reassigned, and the program died. So, bipolar personality. This is a pet peeve. I don't know how many people have run into bipolar personality, but uh, I guarantee you, I have, I have now I, a chapter in my book I'm writing. Is there are at least three that I could I, I will describe in detail in this book, but one of them actually wrote out a 1.8 million dollar check, which I still have. Okay, for a deposit on one of our plants, 1.8 million dollar check. I have it. All right. It's actually now in a little, a little uh, uh, a package. Okay, um, that, 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 that is to preserve it. But he said you can't cash it until I give you the okay. I still haven't been able to cash this check. And this guy <laughs> is really a bipolar personality. And then the other thing is, is you have very little time to recover from mistakes. So in small companies, you make a mistake. And bingo, you're likely to get out of business. And the problem with that is that, and if I put Avis down here, there's a great book by the founder of Avis, Renikoff. He said, if you make two thirds of the decisions correct, you're doing very well. And learn from the other third, and you're going to be very successful. So if you do that in a small company and make one third wrong, you're likely to be out of business. And that's why I thought you know, one in 10 or two in 10 of small companies survive. Okay. Anyway, I didn't go belly up. I didn't go bankrupt like I should have potentially done. I licensed the technology to Prometheus Energy Company. And they then had all this technology. They realized that, my God, what do I do with all this, these drawings, the documents, the files? We had to have somebody that knows how to know what to do with it. So they hired me as their CTO, and they took most of my group with me, and we developed uh, a lot of advanced technology for Prometheus Energy Company. Here's another example. This one here is the one down at Bowerman Landfill in Irvine, California. This is a landfill gas to LNG system producing uh, LNG from some of the dirtiest gas you can possibly imagine. And so really a lot of good, good engineering that went into that. Here's the Yenbacher, the one megawatt power plant that ran off of the gas that we cleaned up from back here and put into that plant. Here's the scale, you drive a truck. This scale is sensitive enough that I could tell which driver we had. It's probably the nearest pound, and I could tell it. And you could tell whether they had a big cheeseburger for lunch or not, even though. <laughs> but but the, this is that tank, the back end of the tank where this LNG is sent off to. And here is the loading system that you load the tanker. Uh, the tanker looks like this. This back is actually an LNG truck. Uh, that's about 9,500 gallons of LNG that Prometheus Energy Company is taking to market. One of the customers was Orange County Transit Authority that ran LNG in some of their buses. But the better one was the Class 8 garbage truck, the, the transfer truck that collected all the garbage from a certain city and, and, and the nearby area. They filled up with LNG that came from the landfill. So talk about a wonderful story. You see them come into the landfill, and you see that they had a blue truck head on their uh, body. And you can say, my god, that's one of our trucks that we're we're fueling the landfill gas that came, I mean, the LNG in that truck that came from landfill. And that was really satisfying. So you get some nice things that happen like that uh, as well. But that's a renewal. That's waste to LNG. That's a really nice thing to think about. And there's a lot of people that today are talking about anaerobic digestion of waste streams of various kinds that convert that to biogas. And we know with this technology how to clean it up and put it into a very valuable fuel. Okay. Hamlet Energy Northwest is my third company, and, and the reason that's a third company is because the, the first the Prometheus Energy Company about a year ago decided that their, their board decided they were closing the advanced development division completely, and they eliminated chief technology officer. So I had an employment agreement, I got paid out for a certain period of time, and then I'm out of a job. So, but they did say, why don't you form another company? So I did, I said, sure, this has been there before, I'll do this, and I did. And so, about a little over 15 months ago, I formed Emerald Energy Northwest. It's an LLC. There's some good reasons for that. It's a limited liability corporation uh, versus a C corporation, which is a standard ink. Uh, but this is my third. And I'm applying lessons to learn from these, these first two experiences. And so, I have about 12 things 
One of them is get cash flow positive very soon. Another one is raise more money than you ever think you're going to need. Okay. Another one is hire the right people and goes on. Because all these mistakes that I made, I'm trying to learn from. And if they don't change me, then what's useful exercise was it? So this enables participation in a great wealth transfer. There's a big wealth transfer when you change from oil and gas to natural gas in this country. You take the bottom line out of this pocket, you're going to put it in this copy, and you might as well participate. If you ask Shell, how do I participate with you on a project? They'll say, buy stock and oil, that's Shell. That's not very satisfying because it's such a humongous company that incremental change to natural gas is small. But if you buy stock in Emerald Energy and West, membership, you have an opportunity to grow massively. <laughs> <laughs> Optimistic, okay. Vertically integrated energy and service company. It's an LNG supply. And, and the same thing as I mentioned early on, when we talk, and I'll show you in a minute, it, it still need supply. You would all be driving a natural gas vehicle or natural gas powered assisted bicycles, probably. No. Uh, if you had refueling stations where you, you can save over that 425, the same gasoline gallon equivalent price for natural gas. $1.99. Same thing. And you can buy some great vehicles, money on natural gas, you just can't get them refueled. And so it kills you. Uh, and the, the, the key thing is that it's a great value proposition for customers because of that. Let me just quickly go through a couple things here and I'll be done. Uh, this is make realistic targets for LNG and CNG refueling infrastructure. So I, I wanted to be sure I was not smoking something uh, that I shouldn't be smoking when I did these numbers. So 10% penetration by 2020. So 10 years from now, what does that mean? We use about 100 quads per year, 25% total for transportation. Total energy, we use about 25% for transportation. Most of it still comes from diesel, but we, we could get a lot of it from natural gas. If we use that from natural gas, there's about 1,000 BTUs per standard cubic foot. That's about this many standard cubic feet per year. Um, Go through 82.6 standard cubic feet per gallon of LNG gives you about three, uh, 300 uh, uh, um, billion gallons of LNG per year, 830 million gallons of LNG per day. That's how much you would need to all of the transportation. Sector. So we're going to take 10% of that. So we need 83 million gallons of LNG today, every day, to be able to supply 10% of our. Day. These are big numbers, okay? But this sounds awful big compared to what we have available at present. But when you then say, okay, what we're planning to build is 50,000 gallons a day plant. And if I do that over 10 years, 660, 1,660, that's okay. I can, that's manageable. I can see that happen. So this is a reasonable number. And for all the rest of the stuff, the investment is about six and a half billion dollars per year. Again, that sounds like a huge number, but it's very manageable from big company finance kind of thing. So this is also doable. Gross revenues, uh, 16,000 stations. There's about 160,000 stations in the United States. Okay, that those 10% of 16,000 where you could refuel. This runs all the numbers. It's about 37 billion dollars a year. So this is actually not bad. A million dollars a day is the business cash flow that you're talking about. Really serious stuff. We're going to participate in this in a big way. And our plan is, is to get to, uh, to, to 10 plants, 500,000 in five years, 500,000 gallons a day. And that's a very nice, attractive thing. Just to quickly finish then, Class A trucks, $70,000 a year. This is a fleet customer problem. Engine emissions are increasing costs dramatically. They have to comply with EPA reduction of particulate matter in NOx. Very powerful uh, constraint. The escalating cost is squeezing profitability. Some of the big companies that run these Class A trucks are just barely above the water line. They're really struggling. It's just costing them so much for, this by the way is about 100,000 miles a year for a Class A truck. That's not the maximum by a long ways, but it's a reasonable number. And the key thing is because of brick, I mentioned that before, diesel cannot solve the problem. It's not going to come back down to 30 or 40 dollars a barrel. So you're never going to see diesel fuel prices again, in my opinion, at $2 a gallon, equal to what we can sell. So that's one of the key things. The next thing is that if we go to the solution, this customer, same customer, same truck, 
running on natural gas, makes equivalent $43,000. They save $27,000 per year per truck. And it costs them about $35,000 extra for that OEM certified warranty truck. So it means that they, in a little 15 months, they've got all their initial investment paid back, and after that, they save $27,000 per year. That's huge to a trucking company. And it also, natural gas already meets the EPA mission easily. And the key barrier is lack of LNG supply, retail infrastructure, da -da. that's where Amber Energy Northwest comes in. We enable this solution. So here is that, here's a design package that we could do. Here's a plant I showed you already. This, here's a refueling station where you would actually, we offer this complete package. We do all of that uh, in our company. Here is the, shows you the fuel, an average of 23,000 gallons, almost a full, four, well, class seven and eight, over 50% of the fuel used in the United States <coughs> is in this, uh, this class seven and eight truck. So it's a very important, big market. That's why Boone Pickens is saying, we want to sell to heavy duty trucks, just because of this very curve, okay? Uh, and you've seen that, on, and we want to do that too. It makes a hell of a lot of sense, and it's cost effective, and so on. Uh, lesson 13, learn how to do financial projections. If you're at all interested in business, you better learn how to do financial projections really well. Understand them. Even if you hire a good CFO, to do, to financial officer, to do all your numbers, you need to understand them. They're really important. So here it shows the gallon production per year, uh, per quarter. This is 60, almost $60 million per quarter up at the end. Here is the Emerald Energy. You know, it's about $45 million of, of uh, annual revenue, and its income is about $20 million a year. So they, that it's, all those things are, are pretty solid, and they're attracting uh, investors as we speak. So, uh, lesson 14, keep pursuing promising sustainable renewable land. You guys all should be doing it. Every one of you should be thinking about, okay, how can, how, how can I make a contribution to something that, that's like this? And I give you four ideas. The number one is already happening. This is, a, this is a shale gas, pipeline natural gas to liquid natural gas, plug and play. So this is now, this is saying, oh, look at that big plant that you saw spread out all over the place. That's a standard skid mounted chemical engineering plant. Let's package that in an ISO container and then just do like Dell does when I get my Dell computer. I take out the computer, I take out all the color coded, and I do all the connections. And within you know, 40 minutes or so, I've got a computer functioning. I want to do the same thing. I want to paint every pipe different colors, and I want to have the plug-and-play capability to hook up a plant uh, and do that. And I'll show you one a picture of that with it. Methane hydrates, it's about 2,000 years of natural gas at the present usage rate um, that we have in methane hydrates. Huge amount. So this is reasonably sustainable. Not renewable, but it's sustainable. Innovation is required to capture this from high pressures, low temperatures, and or heat to sea uh, uh, system. A methane hydrate is just a, a class rate, basically it's got four or five water molecules around a methane molecule. That's what a hydrate is. And it actually is a problem in pipelines. If you have water in a high pressure pipeline, then you'll end up getting a plugging in the pipeline due to the hydrate. So it's a problem for the oil or the gas industry, but it also has enormous amount of methane recovery. This is confirmed by DOE and so on. Gas vacation of coal. This is a really interesting one. If you put hydrogen in the coal gas vacation, you don't get CO2. So normal coal gas vacation is water, and, and then you get carbon plus oxygen to get, to get carbon dioxide. That's what this doesn't do. But this is the simple, simplified version of that, but it's been done at a high temperature fluidized bed combustion. And Arizona Public Service actually built the system. I've seen it. It's probably you know, three times the height of this building here, of, the, of this room, and it was something that was, you can almost walk around easy with your arm. And it, about 1,600 degrees, direct hydrogen injection with coal, bingo. It's beautiful. Now you have methane, you can deal with methane, and we know how to do that, and it's really quite interesting, and it doesn't produce CO2. So that's something of interest to me. You don't need to biogas, the liquid biomethane, um, this is the one I've talked to several of you about, but I'd like, there are about 250,000 species of algae. It grows about 30 times faster than terrestrial-based biomass. So it's, 
It's renewable because it uses solar photosynthesis, and it has a lot of promise. You can take that algae biomass, put it into a digester, make biogas out of it, and now you have, you saw the technology for making liquid biomethane, liquid natural gas from it, and I've done all these numbers on, on this system. They do look quite promising, and if you take about half of the land mass in Alabama, not too many people from Alabama here, but if there are, that, take about half of your land mass in Alabama, grow algae instead of fish in your fish farms there, and catfish farm, and what you will have is enough energy to supply 20% of the nation's transportation needs. So that's what it, it's not like my God, I need the whole land mass of the United States covered with algae farms or the whole half of the ocean. It's very reasonable, in my opinion. Okay, here's, a, here's a, my plug and play concept for what the, a plant looks like. And these, all these will just be dropped in place, they'll be interconnected, and that'll be a, a very fast, uh, flexible model. You know, all these things that, that you get, which are which are seen as important. Here is the, a block process flow diagram. I thought I should have one of these in for chemical engineers. Um, so biogas comes in, pre-purifier, bulk purifier, liquefier, you make LNG out of that. You've got power or refrigerator, your instrumentation control is really important. Here's your algae growth, here's your digester, and this gas would come down here, and I've just left it that. But we've done a lot of analysis on this kind of thing. And the thing that's interesting about it is that this needs CO2, so it's a method of sequestration for CO2. It also gets CO2 from this bulk purifier where the CO2 is removed. About 20% comes from here, 80% from other sources, and you can feed these algae and they will grow very fast. There's a very clever ways of capturing that algae, and you don't have to, you're not trying to make uh, you know, lipid rich algae. Okay? They make, they grow proteins and carbohydrates and lipids, and, and so you just, you don't care. Just let them grow. And you kill them and put them into a digester, they make biogas very nicely, and there's a lot of synergy. So, okay. Uh, there you go. Last lecture. Last, last lecture, okay. Uh, first of all, this is really important to appreciate that hope that energy technologies, vehicles, and for all of these, really cross link so many different things. It's really important to understand these linkages, in my opinion. And so I, I encourage you to, to be students. Of, of these studies. I believe that methane is a great uh, hydrogen carrier. CH bond is very powerful in a methane molecule, and it's a great way to carry hydrogen around. So methane, be uh, carbon becomes a great carrier of hydrogen. And if, if, if you did do uh, neat hydrogen, because you can easily reform methane to make hydrogen, uh, you have a bridge to hydrogen supply. So those are two of the things I think are really important. Obviously, liquefaction is key in that too. Oil stays at $100 a barrel, I made that point. Um, the supply and use infrastructure is a major challenge, but it's a great business opportunity. So then finally, I urge you to find your passion and pursue it with enthusiasm. Most of you that I've talked to clearly are already doing that, which is wonderful. Be objective and open-minded, but let the numbers decide. Really important. Do the numbers. If you're not massive users of MathCAD, then I know, okay, but I use MathCAD, but you run MathCAD and everything should be numbers, okay, uh, when you're making decisions about some new ideas. Remain optimistic without losing touch with reality. How do you do that? I don't know, but, uh, but that's, a, that's a great thing to try, okay? Be flexible and innovative, goes without saying. Uh, be lucky, this is really important, okay? Uh, and, and then the, the last one that I read, I love this one, choose your parents wisely, okay? Because to make a big impact, you have to live a long time, and this is really <laughs> important. One. And you have a lot of control over that, too. But, uh, and, and then finally, hey, enjoy it. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay, so we have time for one or two questions. It is. Yes. Um, they, there's actually, Prax there actually filed a patent on exactly that application, John. Okay. It's not yet industrial. It's not yet industrial, but they thought uh, you know, it was worth spending $8,000 or so to file a patent on it. Um, and um, I think their patent is pretty good patent. So they, I think it's sweet. 
I would say we're about three years away, in my opinion, from having a magnetic liquefier. I didn't show you some of the advanced development prototypes that we built. We built prototypes at, up at, the, at Prometheus Energy uh, and just one stage uh, span, you know, uh, over 50 Kelvin. Gadolinium alone, over 50 Kelvin. And now the, the layering other materials into it, and that's what happened when the, the Prometheus board decided to shut down the advanced development as that program went into limbo. So it's still there waiting to be done once we get back in line. But about three years, I'm hoping that there'll be a small commercial prototype of a magnetic Yes? Uh, you talked about the Yeah. Uh, what's the current status of the Prometheus board? Is it still in the Actually, they've used up just about all the LNG that's being made today in the United States. I'm not saying of the Oh, there's lots of gas wells, but they don't make obviously liquid. So there's there's a, a large number of, of shale deposits in the United States that have been recovered, and they're injecting that gas that they recover out of those wells from uh, into the pipeline structure. And there's a, a, a complete national grid of pipelines all over uh, North America. So you. We use a hub and spoke model. The largest distance we hope to carry liquid natural gas is 150 miles. So we have a plant, and then around it, the customers are, exist within 150 miles. And so that plant will be located right near a pipeline. So it's a very short connection to a pipeline. But there are about 100,000 stranded wells. Just wells have been drilled out in the middle of nowhere. They've been they've hit gas. Uh, they don't have any way to monetize that gas, so they're shut off. So you could go and talk to those people and buy that gas from them as one potential source of gas. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So you talked about more sustainable technologies being centralized and less sustainable being more centralized. But when you look at a lot of the bulk chemical production, you see um, that being working on a larger scale, there's huge economic savings to that. If you look at companies like Dow centralizing ethanol yep. production, that's amazing. How does how does that balance play in here? Oh, that's, that's a good question. They, um, I think it depends on the, what you're doing. Okay. Um, they, first of all, there's a, this, a common scaling uh, uh, equation in chemical industry and, and lots of other things is, is the capacity to the 0.7 power is related to the capital cost of the plant. Okay. So that's, that's one of the things you have to look at as you go bigger, then it gets more cost effective per unit product out. And the same thing is true for these systems, other than the fact that the offset of that making it bigger is the replication of identical systems. So you have the, the economies of replication versus uh, and making these in a factory, which is a lot less expensive than doing a field erection of a big plant where you have to pay a lot of people to crawl all over the big plants um, to make them, make them work. So I would say it's because it's an energy related versus a chemical industry related. And there are big companies. If you talk to Royal Dutch Shell or BP or any of the big oil and gas companies, they will say we are going to build bigger versus smaller. The complication there is that uh, the cost of distributing the liquid natural gas and those tankers uh, that I showed you there is, is, uh, is quite expensive. So if you wanted to bring from Southern California to Seattle, it costs you 45 cents a gallon to get the gallon of fuel up there. Whereas us, uh, uh, making it in near where we use it, the maximum that we pay is seven cents a gallon. So there's a, so the economy of scale that they get from having a large plant is tends to be eroded by the fact that there's a transport cost in the liquid natural gas case, okay? So I think, and the other thing is, you know, I particularly get nervous um, given that we live in a new world, okay? since 9-11 that there is going to be uh, a, a scrutiny on how do we do damage to different uh, parts of a system. If you have big lumped uh, sources of energy production, I think you're setting yourself up for a serious impact. So if it knocks it out, boom. I mean, just look at, at, at New York City, okay, and they lost power and, you know, wow, I mean, the impact. So if you had a big power plant 
where it was centralized, or a big LNG plant where it was centralized, and you, they targeted that, it would have a major impact on, on the fuel. So chemicals industry, I think if that's a concern for them, they should probably distribute. But if it isn't, then I don't see any reason to do anything but go bigger and better. So is that it? Is that, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's save the rest of our questions for the reception, and uh, thank Dr. Barclay. Thank you very much.